just because you can find the root cause or deal with the root cause doesn't mean there's a secondary layer of compensation that doesn't need to be addressed first. Sometimes that is your bottleneck. That is what you have to get through first to then get to the primary cause. So you wanna keep digging, you wanna find what that next thing that you have to work on is. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about doing the right thing at the right time and then going to the next logical step. Hey guys, Greg Chaplin here, physical therapist and strength conditioning specialist. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about the difference between primary and secondary causes of movement related issues. And then I'm gonna talk about how sometimes the secondary cause can become the thing that you actually have to address first to then be able to make progress when it comes to improving movement. So without further ado, let's jump right into the video. So in a previous video, if you haven't seen already, I talked a little bit about the root cause or primary cause of most asymmetry in the body. And this is really probably the root cause of most of our movement related dysfunction. So we have this asymmetrical organ placement in the body. We have different diaphragms. We have different innervations coming down in our nervous system. And we have different sides of the brain that have different dominances. And so we have these asymmetries that are structural and then these behaviors that emerge from them. So if we wanted to think about what the primary cause is, we could think about that structure. And for example, when we look into the uh, lumbar spine here in the pelvis, we have that influence of a smaller left hemidiaphragm and the lack of an organ supporting the uh, underside of that diaphragm. And so we'll get a flatter left hemidiaphragm and often a left side that's moved forward in space like this. With that is accompanied an orientation towards the right. So we all have that asymmetry uh, and those influences of those internal pressures that are going to influence how we move. So if this asymmetry gets taken a little bit too far and we spend a lot of time in asymmetrical positions or with activities that really solidify these asymmetrical behaviors, then we have other parts of our kinetic chain that can get brought into this and then the behaviors of those can start to affect our ability to actually address that asymmetry at that more fundamental level. So let's give a couple of examples of what these secondary causes might be. So a few examples of secondary causes might be like you bear weight into your feet in a certain way and then the muscles in your feet and the bones in your feet adapt and the next thing you know you have a big toe that can't move out to the side on one foot whereas it can on the other. You have a lower arch on one side and you have a higher arch on the other. You might have a bunion on one foot that's painful that prevents you from bearing weight there and now all of a sudden you have this secondary cause that is changing your behavior. So even though if you got the rib cage and the pelvis in a better position, you might start to bear weight a little bit more evenly just because of your position in space. Some of these structural adaptations in the foot and these pain related behaviors might prevent you from actually uh, reorienting yourself fully and using your feet in the way that you want to. So you may have to go down to the foot and do some things locally at the foot to address that before being able to go up into the pelvis and the rib cage and actually sustain those changes. Now I'll tell you a little bit of a quick story to just hammer this point home because I was someone who had to work on the secondary causes to then be able to get to the root cause. And the secondary cause for me was actually vision. So these glasses here are actually not for visual acuity. I have perfect 2020 vision, which is pretty cool, but this is to help the asymmetrical behavior of my eyes. So these are actually made by the founder of PRI, uh, Ron Hareska and Dr. Heidi Weiss who's a neural optometrist who works with him in the PRI Vision Center. And what they did is they made these for me to help me use my eyes in a more symmetrical way. So what these glasses ultimately do is they make it a little bit easier for me to have awareness of my left peripheral visual field and for me to use a little bit less of my right eye in general. So prior to going to see them, my right eye was kind of doing most of the work and it was the only uh, reference that I had for any sort of ambient or peripheral type visual process. So you can imagine this right side had all this space available to it here and my left eye was being very focal and not attending to this peripheral uh, space over here or using this ambient visual process of seeing sort of the space between objects on this left side. So in effect, we had a visual field that was looking kind of like this. And so with that means that the cranium and the neck are gonna orient that way as well. And so this is not 
the primary structural asymmetry that's happening in the diaphragm and the spine. This is more of a secondary layer on top of that that is actually keeping uh, the cranium and the neck in this rightward orientation. So when you try to move the rest of the body into a more neutral state, if the head and the neck can't go there because the eyes don't allow you to see that way, then you're not gonna have a lot of success. You're gonna get pushed back into that pattern and you're actually gonna run into more trouble uh, trying to get neutral than you would if you could get this in the right place. So what ended up happening is I used a lot of the techniques in the pelvis and the rib cage to get into the right position. And I would have some results, but they just wouldn't stick. And so I ultimately ended up playing a little bit with some eye type exercises, moving the eyes laterally, playing with different covering of one eye, covering of the other eye, some vestibular rehab type uh, things. And we can talk about that more in a different video. But what ultimately happened is I felt that when I was doing those, I was able to get my rib cage and my pelvis in a better position. And that's what caused me to reach out to uh, Ron and Heidi. And they ended up working with me with these lenses. And these lenses were actually the thing that allowed me to make all those other techniques actually become effective. And so this is just an example of using a secondary influence of movement to then get down to the primary or root cause. So for all of you that are struggling with something where you're trying to find the root cause or the primary cause or what's actually driving this, the key point that I wanna hammer home here is that just cause you can find the root cause or deal with the root cause doesn't mean there's a secondary layer of compensation that doesn't need to be addressed first. Sometimes that is your bottleneck. That is what you have to get through first to then get to the primary cause. This is often a, process of trial and error. It's very frustrating. Uh, it's time consuming. It can be expensive, but it is ultimately worth it. So you want to keep digging. You want to find what that next thing that you have to work on is. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about doing the right thing at the right time and then going to the next logical step. So thanks a lot for watching this video. If you have questions, leave them down below in the comments, like this video. And until next time, thanks a lot for watching. Peace.